Hi, everyone. My name is Ara. Introduce me. Uh, I'm currently a medical physics resident at University of Washington, uh, and I received my PhD at UT Health San Antonio. And when I was at UT Health San Antonio, I was fortunate enough to experiment with the beam scan and test it, do some research. And, oh, I got an error here that says. Okay. No, oh, it's like it gets crashed. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'll be sharing my experience as a graduate student using the beam scan, working with some collaborators, some other students, and I'll be sharing a variety of highlights and different things that I thought were interesting. So for the talk, I'll talk about receiving the unit because that's certainly part of the experience and how to unpack it, set up, initialize, and I'll talk a little bit about task lists and how they're useful and maybe how they're not useful. And then I'll get into some things that people with scientific inquisitive minds are wondering, like how mechanically precise or accurate is this actual unit. So when we first received the unit, we got this massive crate. And there's my colleague for scale. Uh, his name's Daniel. He's a resident at UT Health San Antonio. And you get this big whopping crate. And you're wondering, how are you going to move this thing? So the first thing you want to do is get a bunch of graduate students to do all the busy work and get the crate ready. So that's what we did. And once you open the crate, you'll see the beam scan's kind of already good to go. It's all intact, it's all in place, so you're wondering, is there much left to do? And there kind of really isn't. It's kind of an optimal uh, delivery. So you get this crate all open, and you can actually use one of the sides and generate a ramp. And so the next thing you want to do is get this thing off. But before you do that, you want to unscrew the base of the beam scan, which is attached to the crate, so that when you ship it, it doesn't rattle. So it's kind of like an intact unit that gets there. And we found that it's really cumbersome to unscrew this thing. So luckily, we had a lot of grad school students, so we were rotating and having shifts with hand work. And so I recommend getting a, a drill with hexagonal drill bits, because the second unit that we received, we used one of those, and it took like five minutes. The previous time we did it by hand, we're talking like an hour and a half, and blisters. So that's my advice for that. So once you get this thing pushed off the ramp, it's good to go, more or less. There are a couple of screws that you want to physically attach to the base of the, the plastic acrylic so that it doesn't tilt off the, the unit itself. And more or less, it looks like most uh, phantoms, but it's got sleek design. And something you'll notice immediately is it doesn't have a physical pendant attached to the unit, which is a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's a curse because some people I mean, physicists who have been scanning for years, they like just going in. They're used to using a pendant. It's something that they're, they've been adjusted to. But there are some pros with using the, the iPod Touch that comes with it. One, it's cordless, so it's less messy, and it's kind of seamless uh, experience. And the other thing is if you break the iPod Touch, no problem. You can just connect your phone, iOS, or Android, and you're good to go. So it's kind of convenient in that regard. You don't have to wait for like service or shipping in the pen and getting it repaired. Kind of a bonus. Uh, other than that, uh, the way we set up the tank for use, we did follow the PTW recommendations because it just it's kind of intuitive. You move the beam scan to the vault. You have to do that with all tanks. You set a 10 by 10 field size, and you're going to align the field light of the LINAC to the center of the tank. There's a nice crosshair at the base. You just kind of get it ballpark. And it doesn't have to be precise because there's a lot of automated features that will help you get it centered and just right. And so you're going to plug the power cord in. You want to do that pretty soon because you want the integrated electrometer and router that connects to the smart devices to kind of uh, sync with each other. So the sooner you do that, the better. And then uh, you wait a few minutes. You let that all cycle in together. And at this point, more or less physically, you're going to be doing the same thing as any other Phantom. Uh, key differences is they have a auto setup wizard, which it comes with their offline HTML-based app which you can use with an iPod Touch or a, a cell phone. And so this is good, because if you're in a hurry or like you take a clinical call in the middle of setting up your scans, you might forget one of these steps. But this wizard kind of helps you like stay oriented so you don't accidentally skip and you're like, oh, I have to go back and do this one. So it just linearly progresses you through each one of the steps. I mean, they're all steps that you've ordinarily done except for the auto water leveling, which is slightly different than other uh, tanks, because it has actual electronic-based sensors. And it moves the arm mechanically to three points and actually in, it internally collects the position of the mechanical arm at each one of the measurements that it takes at different points of the surfaces. And it uses that information to calculate the leveling of the tank. So ordinarily, you take a spirit level and put it on the different sides of the tank to see how 
uh, physically tilted the tank is. In this case, you don't have to because it's an integrated feature. Uh, so if you're inquisitive, you're probably wondering like how well does this work? And so in a few slides, I'm gonna show you some results with that because that's a, that's a valid question. Uh, so for task lists, these can be, or they cannot be useful. So if you're just gonna go in there and check a couple profiles, this is a waste of time because you're setting up all this cumbersome software. Uh, so you see like in this case, there's just like a, a general setup with the queue. You go in, you pick the fields that you're about to scan and you hit run. And so what you do is you turn the Linux on and basically as you get the profile or the PDD that you requested, you hit okay and it, it loads up the next field. You change the Linux and you load up the next Linux configuration and then you hit okay and it goes. And all of the information that's gonna be saved with the files, the input, the output, it's all kind of governed by this queue list. So you can see how that could be useful, say in the case where you have all these scans that are queued up. So uh, an example, you wanna commission the Monte Carlo TPS system like Brain Lab, and they give you this uh, a notebook full of different fields and different output factor scans and different things you wanna do. There's a long, tedious list. So what's good about this is you can kind of plan ahead of time how you're gonna go about acquiring all that data. And uh, sometimes these scans take long and you might put a duplicate entry and then the next morning you go to like process your data and you have two of the same input files. And so doing this ahead of time can mitigate some of those errors or some of those mistakes. And it's pretty easy to use. You can like drag and drop like configurations from the PTW beam scan software. So I think if you're just doing a quick PDD or a quick profile measurement, it's kind of cumbersome. But if you're doing really in-depth scanning, commissioning anything, I think this is a valuable tool. So for mechanical testing, I'm just gonna share a different variety of results that uh, I, I took part of some of these measurements, so some of my colleagues took some of these measurements, so I'm just gonna share the highlights. Uh, so I'll talk about precision accuracy with the arm, uh, auto level detect accuracy, and some acquisition mode differences like continuous and discrete measurements, and my favorite, which is the automatic tilt correction, so that's the last one. So for mechanical test arm accuracy, I know there's a lot of numbers, but if you just look here on the left side, so we basically put the arm to the origin and moved it 10, 20, 50, 200 millimeters, so on and so forth. And we moved it two times, and then we wanted to verify with a caliper exactly how far did it go, did it go where we expected it to go. And so you see for all these measurements, most of them are really small. I mean, we're talking sub-millimeter differences each time. And the tolerance we use in our clinic was 0.2 millimeters, plus or minus. And so all the measurements, they fit within that tolerance, which, which we call an accurate system. So in terms of precision, now you wanna kinda of do the same test, but maybe elongate the number of times you do the trials. So we moved it, in this case, to 100 millimeters and 200 millimeters, 10 times each. And so you'll see each time the uncertainty between all of those expected precision measurements is within 0.05 millimeters. So this is a really accurate setup. So not only is this tank really sleek and cool with all these new gizmos, but it's also a really rigid system. So, uh, and the next thing I tested is the automatic level accuracy. So as I showed you earlier, you get the tank all set up and it has this integrated leveling system. And it uses the three point measurements to calculate the tilt of the tank. And so what we did was we just ran it, you know, a couple times to see how many times it's in agreement with itself. And so you can see that again, the, these are sub-millimeter measurements, and so the expected, the expected is zero, but uh, the standard deviation between all the measurements is 0.06 millimeter in the X and 0.05 in the Y. So really consistent results with the water leveling. And uh, for testing the acquisition modes, PTW calls their discrete, well I call it discrete, but what they call it is a stepwise versus time mode, which is moving to a position, recording measurements, then moving to a position, and it's based off of a time-based time step. And there's the other mode is continuous, which uh, is boasting like really fast continuous measurements, so you just continuously take a stream of data. And so using a 30 by 30 CM field, we measured profiles near the surface and at a, at a depth measurement. I can't exactly remember the, the numbers, but uh, what's important is one of these measurements is taken near the top and one of these is taken at the bottom, so you can kind of get a characteristic of both depths. And we use stepwise on the left and continuous on the right, and then we use a stopwatch to see what the time difference would be when you want to record using these two different modes. And so if we look close to the top, you can see that I mean, there's definitely a little bit of jagged behavior using the continuous mode, but I mean, you can overlay them on top of each other, and, and this is pre-smoothing. I haven't used any smoothing or any kind of 
uh, adjustments to this. This is just raw data, and it's good to go. And if you go a little bit to the lower, you'll see, again, there's a little bit of ripple. But I mean, you're moving that detector really fast, so you're going to expect some sort of ripple. But over less the overall, the shape is matching when you take these slow, discrete measurements. And so if you look at the time difference, it took 4 minutes and 30 seconds using the stepwise versus time mode, and 2 minutes 42 seconds. So I mean, this is just one set of scans. So if you're doing like 20 set of scans, this time can really add up. So using really sophisticated mathematics and really intense complex functions, uh, we calculated that if you use the continuous mode, it's 162 seconds, and the stepwise versus time mode is 260 seconds. So the continuous mode was 60% in terms of the length of the stepwise mode, which is 40% faster. So on their website, they say it's 50% faster, which is true if you don't uh, factor in the fact that the arm has to move into a new position. And so if you record the whole time, not just the scan time, it's, it realistically plays out to be 40%. So it's certainly within the realm of what's advertised. You just have to factor in that the arm is going to move sometimes from left to right or right to left or change the depth. So that could add to the time a little bit, but not much. And uh, my favorite test that I was part of was running their integrated tilt correction. So what we did was actually fill the water to the top to the mark at the top that they um, have lined up on the tank and physically introduced a one degree tilt. So you can see the blue line is where it should be if it was at zero degrees, and the red line is if you introduce a one degree tilt. And so, I mean, in old days or in other tanks, if you're setting up a, a system, you would never want to scan like this because you're, you know, it's just, uh, it's unpleasing. You're thinking, oh, this thing is crooked, so do I trust my data? So we scanned it in three configurations, zero degree tilt, half a degree tilt, and one degree tilt. And we didn't see anything different in all three of the modes. I will say, if you go beyond a one degree tilt, beam scan software will say, like, mm -mm, this isn't going to work. So if it's a drastic uh, tilt or error in the tank, it's not going to let you even scan. But if you're within the realm of one degree, we found that you're always going to get kind of a good scan with integrated corrections. So that's I think, was really interesting. So overall, it's an easy installation. Uh, using the task list for really large uh, scans or commissioning jobs, it really helps you mitigate some of those errors and can you know, help your output the next day when you're processing because you don't have duplicate entries or error entries. Uh, the continuous mode is really fast, so uh, you, you, without any smoothing, it almost looks like the discrete stepwise mode. And uh, we, do, we did see that with one degree tilts, you don't have to correct the tank, although I probably would recommend you test it yourself so you can believe it yourself. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, we, PTW USA hosted a, B, a data collection workshop at San Antonio, and a lot of the grad students and some of PTW, we, were, we took part of it together, and we had a good time doing it. I don't know if they'll continue to get in the future, but if they do, keep your eyes out on it. And if you're interested in learning more about beam data collection or you have a student and you want them to get trained, this is an excellent opportunity for them to come in and get hands-on uh, experience with detectors, scanners, software, so on and so forth. And that's all. Thank you.